To an extent, every Hideo Kojima game is about one kind of epidemic or another. This is a brief overview of how and why. In the original Metal Gear for MSX in 1987, the player must stop the spread of a new kind of WMD, the bipedal weapons platform, Metal Gear. Along the way, you team up with the local resistance force in the midst of a societal breakdown within the mercenary fortress city, Outer Heaven. In Kojima's second game, 1988's Snatcher, a pathogen escapes from a weapons lab during the Cold War. Lucifer Alpha, as it's called, wipes out a huge percentage of the globe. The game actually unfolds 50 years later on the centennial anniversary of World War II as humanity faces an even worse spreading threat, bioroid infiltrators known as Snatchers who secretly steal the identities of important figures to further their secret plan of total global racial unification, in the process rendering the entire Homo sapien species as good as extinct. In the same way as the Nazis, our strategy begins with the overpowering of the spirit of the people. We will strike at you humans' weakest point, the most primitive part of your psychological makeup, your suspiciousness and fear. By provoking suspicion and mistrust throughout the populace, we will destroy that fragile fabric which holds your society together, that of trust. Snatcher takes place on a man-made island, Neo Kobe City, which is under quarantine to halt the spread of the Snatcher menace. Also in the air lingers the mysterious biohazard known as Snow-9, an allergen and artificial pollen that can often be found in the same area as a recent Snatcher. For 1990's Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake, Kojima imagined an end of the Cold War that makes people forget about the threat of nuclear weapons and become obsessed with a new widening existential crisis, as a nod to the Mad Max films, a global shortage of oil. When the enemy force from the first game, marshaled under the totalitarian demagogue Big Boss, returns, they amass stockpiles of nukes by raiding storage facilities around the world, and worse, kidnap a Czech biologist, Dr. Keo Marv, whose revolutionary oil-excreting algae, Oilix, has the power to dictate the fate of the entire world. Following this Japan-only game came another, Police Knots, which portrayed a drug epidemic as well as life and society spent in total isolation among the stars. The colonization of space leaves Earth an abandoned, crime-laden cesspool, and humanity faces all new, widely spread problems in space, from cosmic radiation to corporate monopoly. The Japanese Zaibatsu, or megacorporation Tokugawa, rule over life in the cosmos with an iron fist, albeit one draped in a velvet glove. On their space colony beyond coast, every aspect of life is rigidly policed and controlled, down even to the way that pharmaceuticals are released and spread in the body. On the surface it seems like heaven, yet somehow new potential outbreaks rear their heads. From terrorism to new kinds of cancer, to organ trafficking on the black market, to, worst of all, a new synthetic superdrug called NARC. which spreads widely to help the lonely and isolated people on Beyond cope with the stress. After Police Knots came 1998's Metal Gear Solid, which depicted a much ignored yet rapidly spreading threat in the post-Cold War age. Nuclear proliferation, nuclear terrorism, plant meltdowns, and the long-term ecological impacts of storing nuclear waste. The threat of nuclear war isn't gone. In fact, it's greater than it's ever been. The amount of spent nuclear fuel and plutonium is increasing even today. Listen, have you ever seen a warehouse full of nuclear material? No. Drums and drums of nuclear waste stacked this high, as far as you can see. Because there's still no real way to dispose of the stuff. So they just close the lid and try to pretend like it'll go away? Uh, essentially, yes. 
and they're not even doing a good job of storing it. Many of the drums are corroded, with nuclear waste seeping out of them. Unbelievable. Not only that, but several pounds of muff are reported every year. Muff? It stands for material unaccounted for. It proves that there's a large and well-organized black market in nuclear materials. Furthermore, since the end of the Cold War, Russian nuclear engineers in particular are out of work with no way to turn. Still ticking, huh? Unfortunately, hell had no vacancies. Then, in 2001's Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, Kojima tackled environmental terrorism, oil spills, and the prospect of an electromagnetic pulse-related terror attack. But the worst catastrophe by far MGS2 covered had to be the Chernobyl-sized explosion of half-truths and culture wars fostered by the rise of the internet at the turn of the century, as well as the impending threat of a possible counter-revolution by the very source of our digital age, the military-industrial complex. MGS2 foresaw a future defined by surveillance and an inability to tell apart fact from fiction. Ironic that although self is something that you yourself fashion, every time something goes wrong, you turn around and place the blame on something else. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. In denial, you simply resort to looking for another, more convenient truth in order to make yourself feel better. Leaving behind in an instant the so-called truth you once embraced. Should someone like that be able to decide what is truth? Should someone like you even have the right to decide? You've done nothing but abuse your freedom. You don't deserve to be free. We're not the ones smothering the world. You are. For 2004's Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, Kojima portrayed the man-made disasters not only surrounding nuclear brinkmanship and scientific experimentation, but also the psychological infection, so to speak, during the Cold War of a new orthodoxy which treated all members of the opposing side as absolute enemies, even when they were former allies and friends. The theme of the game was deterrence, which claimed to make the world safer, but in fact did anything but. Why are you doing this? Why? To make the world one again. The world used to be whole. But with the end of the Second World War, the philosophers began to fight amongst themselves, and the world was torn apart. It'll become a killer virus that attacks untold numbers of victims. What if we kill them all, remove them from the body? There are no antibodies either. I don't know what percentage of the receptors have to break down, or how many people will be targeted when that happens. But what is certain is that people will begin to catch fox dye through airborne transmission. It'll start with those closest to you. Then, one by one, they'll lose their lives. In 2007's MGS4, meanwhile, the epidemic is nanomachines that function as a form of techno-totalitarian command and control. Yet the cure is worse than the disease here. A demented revolver ocelot seeks to hijack the so-called SOP system and use it to take over the world. Stopping him requires a rapidly aging old snake, now a living, breathing weapon thanks to a mutated strain of the virus and bioweapon from MGS1, Fox Dye, to find a way to shut down the SOP pathogen of nanomachines for good, thereby exposing the world to possible withdrawal symptoms and the subsequent widespread social, psychological, and economic collapse. What? What?
in 2010's Peace Walker, it is the cancerous spread of artificially intelligent weapons platforms that must be halted before disaster strikes. In 2014's Ground Zeroes, we're shown the origins of a post-Cold War infectious spread of torture and sectarian conflict personified in one cancerous figure, a diseased individual both physically and spiritually known only as Skullface. Meanwhile, in The Phantom Pain from 2015, we are told that the 1980s were the decade that human beings were infected with a terrible parasite of the mind to become weapons who learn to walk upright, seeing their terrible fate in doublethink fashion in terms of racial, ethnic, or ideological superiority. A literal epidemic is introduced in the game, which is said to kill based on the language spoken by the host. This gradually morphs into a metaphor for a number of infectious diseases brought about by globalization since the 1980s, from AIDS to Ebola to, maybe most of all, things like proxy warfare, petropolitics, blood diamonds, conflict minerals, and private militaries. Finally, there's Death Stranding, released in 2019, a game where a bizarre catastrophe brings into our universe mysterious particles including the pollutant as well as energy source called chiralium. Chiralium warps our perception of time while polluting the atmosphere with strange rain clouds that dump a time accelerating byproduct on the landscape, somewhat like acid rain, called timefall. The game also features a physiological disorder known as dooms, which brings its subjects into a greater connection with the world of the dead. Every Hideo Kojima game, since he began working in this industry in the late 80s, has been a work of science fiction and a meditation on the relationship in the modern age between the health of the individual and the status of their environment, be that environment ecological or geopolitical, and all points in between. The Phantom Pain, as well as Death Stranding in particular, seem to have foretold the present global crisis we now live in, drawing as they both did from prior near misses like the SARS epidemic in the early 2000s to urge the player to realize that in a totally connected global society without borders, one defined by the new form of post-industrial capitalism known as globalization, a mass epidemic and other disasters from terrorism to ethnic cleansing to the breakdown of truth itself are not questions of if they happen but when. In this way, Hideo Kojima has always sought to make not games you play only to pass the time or escape reality with, but ones that will help you confront some of the biggest issues of our time in an artistic way, and in so doing, move the medium forward.